So now what? Save the world? Anyone could be one of them. Controller. Trust no one. Welcome to Thought Speak, everybody. Uh, we have a special guest tonight. Uh, you might recognize him. This is author and co-creator of Animorphs and the God series in Berserk, as well as he has a new book out called Frontlines, which we're going to talk about tonight. And we'd just like to welcome him to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Grant. And we could spend, you know, all day kissing your ass and sucking up to you, sir. But <laughs> ultimately, we are here for the fans, and we've got questions that... Uh, have been burning in our hearts for a very long time. Um, before we dive into the Animorphs, however, we would like to talk about uh, some of your other works. Sure. Although I always have plenty of time to have my ass kiss. So. <laughs> well, we'll <laughs> fit that know. in. Let's rearrange our schedule. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> uh, well, I really wanted to start out talking about your new book. Um, this is something that I've been getting into for the past week, and uh, I've been really, really enjoying it so far. Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's excellent. And um, first off, I mean, what was your what was your reasoning? Why did you want to write uh, Frontlines, this this book about uh, if women were drafted into World War II? You know, it's weird. Every single time somebody asks me where something came from, I'm I'm almost always at a loss. So lately, I've been trying to pay attention at the beginning of a project and go, okay, now remember this later on. This is how this started. So so I kind of remember. For one thing, my uh, father-in-law had pushed a book off on me, uh, uh, actually three books, a trilogy called The Liberation Trilogy by Rick Atkinson, which is about World War II in the European theater. And um, I, I didn't want to read it because I felt like I'd done enough World War II, and I was just going over old ground. Then I started reading it, you know, to keep him happy, basically, and thought, uh, wow, what a bunch of stories. You know, and it's just like uh, it's just like finding a chest full of, uh, of gold nuggets or something for me because <laughs> I'm always looking for an interesting story. And then you look at World War II, you might you go, oh my God, it's like a billion stories. It's it's every story you could ever possibly need is all packed into this massive uh, world changing event. So that was part of it. Uh, part of it is marketing um, that uh, basically, in part perhaps because of Rachel from Animorphs. A market grew up, uh, which in young adult, for strong female action heroes, action leads, mm -hmm. um, and I've of course written numerous of those down through the years. But um, it, it started to look like we were kind of all getting a little burned out on dystopian approaches to this. Dystopia basically being, you know, the world is hopelessly screwed up, and only a 16-year-old girl with a bow and arrow can save it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm, I'm being snarky about it. And these are, you know, I've written that stuff myself and so have many of my friends. But, um, you know, fundamentally, that's what it came down to. And I just was like, uh, we're, I'm bored with it. Uh, publishers are bored with it. Uh, I don't know if readers are bored with it, but everybody at the production end of things is bored with it. And so I was thinking, how do I, how do I basically continue to feed a market for strong female action characters and, without going dystopic about it? And I thought, oh, wait a minute, here's a thought. And then the third part of it was just I wanted an angle. Um, you know, I, I want a hook. I, if I'm going to write about World War II, it's very hard to stay away from cliche. And it's very hard to avoid, uh, you know, hagiography with it. Um, and I, I wanted to be very real about it, but I wanted to get uh, a different angle on it so that people would pick it up and go, oh, okay, that's, yeah, World War II, I get. But this is completely different on the you know, and that so that's what I was after. I was after an angle. I was after marketing, um, and I was uh, just thought what a treasure trove of stuff to write about. Well, I think one of uh, two of my favorite parts of the book are just how, um, even though you have this hook, you have this alternate history. I think a lot of people might expect even more like sci-fi elements or or something to kind mm -hmm. of creep in. And what I've enjoyed so far is that it's a very straightforward, very realistic. World War II drama with this one change. It's almost like, um, to bring Animorphs into it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. in the Alumnus Chronicles, their game was to change one thing as small as possible and then right. have that go forth and, and, and change the evolution of a species of this alien game they were playing. And um, that's what it is. Everything else is, is, is World War II, but you have this hook, this, this drama that these women were such a big part of it that they weren't before. Um, and as well, the yeah, that was 
That's exactly how I'm writing it. I'm writing it as though um, as though this change has no other impact. In other words, that the war goes goes ahead precisely as it went ahead. So mm-hmm. the history remains the history. We're not going to have a surprise ending where you know Hitler wins. Uh, it's still <laughs> going to be. I'm, I'm still following the actual history uh, as closely as I know how, without being a professional, um, you know, an actual historian mm-hmm. or even educated. But <laughs> given those given those limitations. Thanks to uh, books, the Google and uh, Wikipedia and a whole lot of other things, um, YouTube in particular. Um, I've got access to like so much research, so much data. It just it's again, it, the, the problem with dealing with any kind of World War II story is that it, it wants to keep getting bigger. So I thought if I go at this, what I'm going to do is basically write about a platoon. And in that, I was kind of channeling the old uh, TV show Combat mm-hmm. from a million years ago. But then that was also, by the way, part of the inspiration for Animorphs was Combat. It was a show with Vic Morrow back in, I don't know, the 60s probably. And every week, this little platoon in France of American soldiers, you know, after D-Day, post-D-Day, would have a little mission and have a little moment and, you know, shoot somebody or get shot or, you know, rescue a, a French woman from being uh, attacked by beastly Germans or, you know, whatever the story mm-hmm. was. And that was kind of our approach with Animorphs. And I thought, I'm doing the same thing with this. I'm going to focus tightly on these three women, basically, and the, the men and women around them to a lesser extent, but essentially these three main plot lines. And I'm going to just stick to it rigidly. and I'm not going to let it get away from me. But within that context, I'm going to do is I'm going to have as much fun as I can. So I'm going to insert some Zelig like into all kinds of situations where that are plausible in terms of the in terms of the calendar, but which aren't specifically historical, if you know what I mean. So they were at the Battle of Kasserine. They'll be at the Battle of Monte Cassino. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I won't have them sign. I can't have them at Anzio because Anzio conflicts with D-Day in yeah. terms of timing. So that kind of thing I stick with. I'm I'm historically accurate. Nevertheless, there's a certain fluidity in where they happen to show up, you know, on the battlefield. So they'll they'll be at the, they'll, they'll tend to show up the worst. <laughs> That's the worst of things. So it's you're not going to, to trap Hitler in a <laughs> theater fire? No, I, I you know, I, um, I, I think that the first of all, I, I have a really profound respect for history. And speaking of animals, we wove history in repeatedly into there. I, I know there was at least oh, one. God, my, my memory isn't that great, but I know we uh, we dealt with the uh, kill Hitler uh, thing at some point. Um, yeah, in, more in one of the long form books. Yeah, could be. Um, so I've always cared about history and I have a lot of respect for it. And I, I want insofar as I can to teach it in, in this book accurately, even though it's a book about an alternate history. The other major change I made, by the way, is I advanced the combat role of black troops into earlier in the war. Um, they weren't pushed into combat much until 1944. Uh, right. For the you know the completely uh, obvious reasons, which are that uh, it was a segregated army, it was run entirely by white officers, um, with like one or two exceptions, and those white officers tended to be from the south in many cases. So, not all that anxious to arm black people. Surprise, <laughs> <laughs> send them into combat. But later on, you know, when when the numbers uh, started getting desperate, when things started, when we were starting to run out of soldiers, starting to run out of men. Uh, people weren't volunteering anymore. Uh, it was just down to draft boards. Then suddenly it occurred to them, um, you know, we got all these guys standing around here cleaning pots, and we could probably give them guns and go shoot people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's worth noting, even even in the Civil War, you know, even the South at the end uh, considered uh, uh, bringing in black troops, freeing slaves and enlisting in this troop to fight for slavery which, you know, does make some kind of sense out of that, a particular bit of madness. But much the same in World War II, when they were driven to necessity, suddenly they discovered uh, that black troops could actually fight and were useful. Yeah, yeah that's, well, uh, that's, I think that goes into my next question with um, the characters, sure. is I think throughout your series that you've written, um, you have this core group of main characters who really mm-hmm. feel like different people. I think that's that's incredibly hard as a reader and as a very early starting out as a writer um, to not have every single character have your same voice. And I think Frontlines is very specific in that, that 
these feel like three girls who are completely different, grew up completely differently and, and don't feel like they're all Michael Grant speaking, you know, through their mouth. So it is, I, I assume that's incredibly I, important to you. I, I try really hard uh, to avoid inserting myself in my books, which is weird because anybody who knows me will tell you I'm a huge egomaniac uh, <laughs> in real life. You know, I'm the guy who will start telling a story on an elevator and, you know, hoping that everybody listens. I'm, I'm that kind of an asshole sometimes. <laughs> but in my, in my books, it's just the opposite. I don't want anybody paying attention to me. And every now and then I'll get something, you know, your prose is so simplistic. And I go, I know. It's deliberate. I could absolutely make it more Baroque. I could make it more complex. I could spend more time on description. But every time I do that, I feel like I'm saying, look at me, and I don't want you to look at me. I want you to look at the characters. So if you're reaching a point in the book and you go, wow, that's a, that's a hell of a metaphor, Michael, then I'll feel like I've failed, you know, because I, that's not the point. The point is, here's the story. Listen to the story. Pay attention to the story. Care about the characters. But and it's nice. It's really nice that people are uh, almost almost everybody is uh, very um, kind in describing my characters as being as having unique voices, and I have literally no idea how that's accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> like any good especially writer knows. Because, <laughs> especially because I, I don't really I don't have friends. I don't know people. Uh, you know, Catherine's been my only friend for. Uh, with, I got, now it sounds pathetic, but I'm an introvert, so it's not. But Catherine Applegate, my wife, has been my friend for, you know, 36, whatever it is, 37 years. Um, and neither of us has really had another friend outside of each other. I think she's got, you know, like half a friend. Uh, <laughs> I don't. And I have, I've, I had one guy who was a friend for a while until we, until I hated him. Um, that's beside the point. You know, so I'm not. Like, you know, some guy who's going, oh, I'm going to use Joe in this next scene. I'm going to take his voice. That's just not it. Yeah. Um, I just make him up out of whole cloth. Well, I think it, sh- it really shows that you, you care about oh, doing thanks. that, even if you don't know how you do it. <laughs> it uh, I have no idea. It comes through every time. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, speaking of Catherine, I'd like to open this up to uh, more than just Frontline's questions now. Um, I sure. read uh, Even Adam quite a while ago, and... Uh, I understand that uh, you wrote all of the male protagonists solo while uh, nah, Catherine... that's, that's, no, that's crap. I think that was, that was an <laughs> idea crap. that got around early on. Uh, no, basically, this is... First of all, it, in our career together, Catherine and I have written well over 100 books together. Yeah. And every possible iteration that you can imagine, every possible formula for how that could get done, we've done at some point. So everything from, you know, she did it all to I did it all to handing chapters back and forth to taking particular characters to taking the front half of the book, the back half of the book, you know, the, the exposition, the, the action. We, we've broken up it, every, you know, the answer is all of the above. But people say, how do you do it? It's got you, all of it with usually with a lot of yelling. Um, but even Adam, and even Adam, we resisted doing it. We didn't want to do it. Um, Gene Fywell, though, asked us to and Gene Fywell is the editor who acquired Animorphs and changed our lives and ah, so yes. when Gene Fywell says do something we go yes ma'am although we tried to weasel out of it by setting a what we thought was an absurdly high price thinking Gene would go I screw you two uh, <laughs> and we'd be out from under and then she was like no I'll pay that and we were like sweet so we wrote the book but I think fundamentally I, I built the bones and, and Catherine put the, put the meat on it Okay, it's terrific. Well, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed even Adam. It is, it, even if you didn't want to do it, I, I enjoyed it. Um, oh, no, it's not okay, but yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Just okay? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> no. um, so, I don't, uh, uh, you know, I'm not the guy to praise my own, my own work. Uh, of, you know, of course, of course. Usually. My only question was if that process was different at all, how was it? But it apparently wasn't different. <laughs> no, it was just it was a lot less yelling. It was, it was funny. <laughs> I think we've mellowed over the years. But, you know, we, mostly when we were working, uh, um, so we've been writing for, what, 25, 26 years. Well, for the first half of that time, uh, we didn't have kids. Uh, our first child was 18 now, so we, we started having kids 18 years ago. Wow. But prior to that, we were just writing on our own. So we had plenty of time to run around and get very dramatic with each other. Um <laughs> and argue over, you know, what a scene should be and the rest of this kind of crap. And you get these kind of ridiculous parodies of domestic conflict, you know, instead of how, how could you leave the kitchen such a mess? It would be, 
you know, what the hell with chapter four? How did you leave that? Jesus, look at that. What are you kidding me? What am I supposed to do with that? You know, what were you saying? Oh, I wasn't like, oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, and pretty soon that blows up. Honey, um, you were supposed to now, fill that plot hole by <laughs> tomorrow. Exactly. Exactly. Well, don't set it up like that if you don't know where it's going. You know, that kind of conversation. <laughs> So, um, but this time it was very, uh, very easy and mellow. And I think it's largely because once we started having kids, we realized we had to take our, our, uh, yelling energy and, and oppress our children instead of, <laughs> <laughs> instead of wasting time arguing over crap between the two of us. So we, we did it. We were very professional in and out. I wrote it quickly. Um, and it seemed to work. People liked it. So Terrific. Coleman, what's your next question? Uh, I'm. Uh, do you have more questions about Berserk or anything else? Because I, I have Animorphs questions. After oh, this. you want to dive into the? An- no, 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 not yet, my friend. <laughs> I just finished reading Messenger of Fear. Uh, congrats, Michael. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that as well. Um, I felt that it had a very episodic feel to that, and I mm-hmm. also felt that yeah. it would work quite well as a series. Just throwing that uh, out. There. I wrote a. Well, we originally set it up to be. Um, a three book deal, I think. We made it. Yes, deal, I've heard many things honest, on it. it. It's quite confused online. It didn't. It didn't sell. I mean, that's the bottom line. Oh. And so, Catherine Teagan, as opposed to um, Applegate, you had my other Catherine, Catherine Teagan, my boss, my publisher, my editor, basically said, you know, it's not selling. I go, yeah, I know. I can see the numbers too. Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, how about we wrap it, you know, and I'll pay you back your the partial advance on that, and we'll uh, move on to something else. Um, and I had I had already by that point, you know, I, I, I tend to write two series at the same time. So a couple of years ago, I had gone to her and said, um, I got this. Here's the thing. Here's how I see the market going. Here's where I think things are going. So I'm going to I want to lay down two bets. One, I'm going to bet on horror. And the other, I want to bet on alternate history. And so that was Messenger of Fear and Frontline. And uh-huh. um, Messenger of Fear. uh was my attempt at horror. But I think I also, I, I'm not sure I did a great job with it, to be honest. I think, um, I think it's morally, um, uh, let me just say, I'm not sure I agree with the morality of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Michael, do you want sure my think... honest opinion on it? Yeah. I'm not here to sugarcoat it. I'm here to tell you yeah. honestly, I myself wouldn't classify it as horror. It kind of isn't, is it? <laughs> well, I see that. That's it. That's the thing because I got I got bogged down as I as I tend to do, uh, in in philosophical and moral and ethical uh, questions. Um, I, no, don't know, get me I'm, wrong. I'm, I love I'm the premise a... of punishing those that deserve the punishment and are going to go unnoticed. Great premise, mm-hmm. yeah. and I love the backstory yeah, uh, that you set up with the gods. Yeah, I want to know more about it. <laughs> Well, well, I got those too, but that I think it, it, we kind of mostly wrap it up, and and I don't know, it's starting to pick up a little bit now, and in, in it's kind of afterlife, um, which happens sometimes with my books. It takes a while before they catch on. Um, they don't come right out of the gate hot necessarily, but over time they kind of build. Up. After all, like, oh yeah, I see what he was thinking there. Like I still get people reading Berserk, and Berserk yes. sold for sold for shit when it came out, um, not for lack of trying on the publisher's part or uh, Barnes and Noble backed it. I mean, a lot of people did. It just didn't sell very well because well, it's just such a strange piece of work. I exactly. Mean, it's, it's, um, it's, I yeah. read it and uh, frankly, I'm terrified of nanobots now. <laughs> mm. I wanted to know what kind of research you put into all that uh, stuff and how Horrible likely is mis- this gray goo scenario? Disturbing, uh, disturbing amounts of research. Mostly, <laughs> um, I looked at scanning electron microscope pictures of various microflora and microfauna living on and uh, around the human body. Terrifying and, creatures. You know, you, but yeah, you spend enough hours of the day looking at that. And then you have to kind of get down in that, that mindset, you know, where, where, okay, this is real now. I'm actually buying into this, you know, and, and trying to tell myself at the same time not to be creeped out by it all. Well, I'm sorry, but if you're looking at a mite that lives in your eyelashes, um, and watching, looking at video of it over and over again, so you can describe it, and thinking, yeah, that's living right now in the eye that I'm actually looking through to look at this picture. Um, that gets you. That can get a little strange. Oh, some of the um, most disturbing imagery of the human body, certainly. Yeah, it's it's, it's gross stuff, and of course, it's my job to make it grosser still, <laughs> to expand upon the 
expand upon the weirdness. But um, it also berserks, you know, not to get too inside baseball, but I violate core, you know, approaches to YA. I certainly, um, you know, I, it, it reads much more like a like a standard adult science fiction. Novel. Oh, the plane yeah. crash in the beginning? Are you kidding me? I was like, how is this yeah, young adult? <laughs> and the romance is understated. Um, you know, characters are killed off, you know, in my usual style. And everybody's a little, and the, the multiple names thing and the confusion of identity, the confusion of reality, I think ends up making the characters hard to attach to because there's a there's an uncertainty introduced into everything. You never know who to trust, who to believe, or what's going to happen. Uh, even what side anybody's on half the time. So it was, uh, yeah, I think it was, I think maybe it was, uh, maybe it'll have a second life somehow. If somebody can sneak it around the corner into adult science fiction shelves, I think it would probably do better. Certainly. I think it was a, the wrong thing for, for YA. It was too far into, into you know, weird Michael. <laughs> sure. You know, so, we could ask you tons and tons of questions about the Gone series, one of your most popular series, mm -hmm. but the sad truth, Michael, is that neither of us have read Gone yet, and we're wow. getting to it, honestly. We could it's do only, another, we could do a whole other podcast on Gone. Long. <laughs> it's only 3,000 pages long, dude. you got to get, get started on that. It's uh, in here, here's what I'll say about Here's what I'll say about Gone. We both knew, Catherine and I, both felt we screwed up the ending to Animorphs. Um, and we know why we did it, and it was satisfying to us. But readers, I'd say about 90% of readers, really hated it. So I was determined not to do that again. And I thought, Okay, wait a minute. You you got to do something here, Michael, which is recognize that you're not in this alone. The readers are in it too. This isn't just what makes you happy. You got to also think about delivering a satisfying experience to the reader, and and wrap the thing. Well, well, I don't plan, you know. So everything with me is improv. I make everything up every day, with no poor planning. So it was a nerve wracking job to figure out could I, at the end of three thousand pages, wrap up all these plot threads and all these characters and all these events, 3,000 pages worth of stuff, and make it all make sense. And then apparently I did because the readers were... I, I, I don't think anybody's complained. That's the weird thing. It's none of that like, oh my God, it's all blogging. I screwed it all at the end. Um, everybody's been happy with the ending. And so then I felt like, okay, well, that's good. I've redeemed the Animorphs ending. Like by ending a series in an appropriate and intelligent and uh, competent way. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think it's I don't think it's terrible though that um, with Animorphs you said you know like ninety percent of the audience uh, thinks she's, that ending was screwed up, but it's not because they thought it was bad. They just wanted more. It's just, I mean, that's a kind of a compliment that people just were really interested in the ending of Animorphs and and wanted to see where it where it went. Well, the odd thing was we were leaving it open. Um, you know, at the end when they, when they turn the ship around and they, they charge basically, um, and, and somebody got this the other day and read it and it, I did it read at AMA the other day. And, um, I don't think anybody had ever said this before. And I, of course, forgotten about it. I guarantee you Catherine's forgotten about it, but it was a deliberate callback to an earlier event, uh, in which Elfengor, I believe, uh, does exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, basically turns the ship around and goes. So accidental kind callback? Of a little now was a little fly wink. We, we I knew that was in the in the background of the you know in the backstory of the series, and I thought, well, a lot of people would get you know that that this is probably not the end. That there's probably some other solution, and I was deliberately leaving it open so that we could continue it if we wanted to. Um, but you know, yeah, the flip side of that was after 63 books, we were kind of like, yeah, we've we've picked the bones of Star Trek for every plot we can rip off, of it, <laughs> and we're kind of running out, running out of story here. Um, as a matter of fact, we thought in book 11 we were out of story. Right about then, we were like, yep, that's it. We've done it all. But wow. before then, you were still foreshadowing Krayak. What? <laughs> I know. We had, well, we kept digging it deeper, you know, finding more stuff in there. It ended up being, you know, we had to we had to go further into sci-fi and less into animals. Basically, sure. as the series progressed in order to find uh, new plot elements. You got to um, use all the tropes. <laughs> one of the, I mean, one yeah, of my... Yeah, we had, we had I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, one of my, I mean, it's interesting you say that by book 11, when I think a lot of people agree that some of the best uh, best stories are not only at the end of the series in general when um, the ghostwritten books were over, but in the 20s, in the early 20s, in book 19, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the David trilogy, you talk about it becoming more sci-fi, sci the David trilogy was straight 
a character study and yeah. uh, and a human being a huge enemy and seeing how dangerous these animorphs really were by them having to face one. Um, I mean, that in my the David trilogy is my favorite part of the entire series. To, um, to this day, I cannot believe Scholastic let us get away with that. Oh my god! My only <laughs> I don't I don't think they were reading them at that point. Because, you know, they're getting them. Uh, we're only six months out from publication. Typically in publishing, you're a year out. But we were six months out. And it was basically, I used the analogy on Reddit the other day of the famous I Love Lucy bit yeah. uh, from the 50s where she's working on the chocolate uh, assembly line. It's kind of like that. You know, we were like, oh, my God, we're, we're putting out 14 books a year, um, which is not what rational, normal you know, writers do. And we were working on other stuff. So Animorphs wasn't even all we were writing. Uh, right. We had a, another series called Barfarama, um, which I'm, my wife will be happy to pretend I wrote entirely by myself. And I did <laughs> write most of it. But um, but that was going on simultaneously. I'd, I'd work on Animorphs in the morning and then go work on Barfarama at night for a oh, long wow. time. And then Everworld was in Everworld was in the mix toward the end uh, as we were trying to get you know trying to get a uh, Hawaii uh, series going. So yeah, we're we're producing. I don't know between the two of us, probably you know, sixteen, eighteen books a year. So there wasn't a lot of time for second guessing or screwing around on Scholastic's part or ours. So I think by that point they were just like, yeah, kids trapped in a box as a rat. Okay, sure, why not? <laughs> you know, going back to that ending there, I have to ask you, sir, if if you had given any consideration to uh, this this theory my co-host came up with, which was a, a humane way to have ended the David situation uh, by making him more f- maybe a dog and sticking him with the chi, perhaps. Yeah, that would have been a much more humane way. But would it have stuck with you for years and years like the rat thing did? <laughs> oh, exactly. No. Exactly. <laughs> You got you got to you got to look for the dark sometimes. You yeah, know, just find then, out what's the uh, what's the most intense, craziest uh, thing you can do within the reality of your series. It definitely paid off because yeah, that's one of the bigger impact storylines of the series. And speaking of yeah, that, thanks. speaking of the violence and the um, the mature themes early on when you were first starting out in the first few books, which carry mm-hmm. a few of them themselves uh did you get any pushback from scholastic uh what, what were their feelings on the no on the it's, it's weird um we had really good relationships with scholastic all the time we were working on this um and to such an extent that you know the the ghosting operation when we finally when we finally went to ghostwriting uh was largely run by our editor working for us so we were in the bizarre position of having an editor we reported to and having to get ghostwritten manuscripts ready for her, for Tanya. And then thinking, well, we're not really very good editors. Who could take a look at this stuff and get this stuff ready for Tanya? And we thought, I know, Tanya. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we basically hired Tanya to help prepare manuscripts for herself. And um, that worked out That worked out pretty well. Um, and especially toward the, you know, the ghosting thing, the problem with the whole ghosting operation was that uh, we were so close to pub date that we only had six months. So, uh, you know, we'd get manuscripts and look at them, go, I've got a problem here, here, and here. And it came down to, can we get the writer to turn this around essentially overnight? Um, or is it just easier to write 40 pages? And we go, yeah, let's just write 40 pages. <laughs> so we just take the manuscript and throw out 40, 50. I mean, I think in one case, 100 pages. And the ghostwriters just justifiably hated our guts, and they should have. We paid them far better than the market typically did. Um, but that said, we didn't give them the opportunity to you know, correct their mistakes. It was kind of a, a one and a one and done. So their first draft, if their first draft wasn't done, if it wasn't essentially perfect, it was more efficient for us uh, to simply throw it out and, or throw out pieces of it and rewrite it. Well, that was that's not a, a way to run the operation. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. So we tended to um, devolve power more and more onto Tanya to run uh, toward the end of the ghostwriting operation and and backed out of it, and then came in again at the end to write fifty three and fifty four. And we, of course, we wrote all the long form the megas and the chronicles mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. We yeah, actually. Which... Oh, <laughs> go, go ahead. We just wrapped up. Yeah, I was I was going to tell you that we actually, um, you know. 34 minutes ago uh finished recording our hork chronicles review uh oh, nice. so that's where we are we are just about to get into uh the ghost written books 
and uh we well, no not exactly <coughs> we're close we've we're got close, two yeah. more books <laughs> and uh but was, we we've never read happy those with Jure chronicles we like horse your chronicles we thought we did uh we, we enjoyed doing that because it was um because it had gone off in this it became a well the vietnam parable to a great yep. extent up, up until the point of even stealing the uh famous we had to burn the village down in order to save it line from uh from some anonymous soldier in, in Vietnam, and I'm misquoting the line, but it was to that effect. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, we had to, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. So I I think that's even included in there in some mutated form. But that Wait. was kind of the idea of it was, uh, and the corruption of innocence. You know, that the Horkbusher were an innocent bunch, uh, minding their own business, you know, eating tree bark and having a swell time, and then that the world kind of came down on them in the form of the two big superpowers in terms of you know, the Andalites and the Yerks taking indigenous people and, you know, using them for their own benefit, exploiting them. So there was, there was a lot of political, you know, theme going on and a lot of political themes around there. So we, we had fun. And I thought we came up with some, irad- uh, some original and imaginative stuff. So that was, that was fun. We had, we had a good time with that book. So I hope you guys liked it. Oh, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, uh, the series is actually printed in over 25 languages. Um, are yeah. there any are there any countries or languages that the series sold surprisingly well in besides America? You know, we don't know. We get um, what we know of sales. We get every six months they send us a royalty statement, which is uh, like sixty or seventy printed out pages, which are I don't know that they're deliberately obscure, but I've never <laughs> met a writer who has any idea what the hell they say. Um, <laughs> mostly, if uh, they either pin a check to it or they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, animals could be huge in like Argentina and you just don't know. <laughs> yeah. We don't know because back when animals was around, you know, we didn't have um we didn't have the web basically. We didn't have that kind of well it existed, but not to the extent and the uh um it, the way it does now. So like in those days you put a book out there and you have no idea if anybody liked it. Now I put a book out and I just sit there and wait for my Twitter feed to light up and for Amazon reviews to show up and for Goodreads. So I go to Amazon, Goodreads, and Twitter, and I know pretty quickly whether somebody's reading the book or whether they like it or if they have objections, what they are. But that kind of feedback loop did not exist in those days, so you would put stuff out there not now. I will say this. A friend of mine called up from uh, – this this would be the former friend, my, my singular former friend – called up, and he was driving through Spain. Um, and Spain, you know, in the center of the country, is largely desert. And he said, I just pulled off the road to get gas in the middle of Spain, out in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, this little one one gas station town. And I go in the store, and there's your books, Animorphs books, translated into both Castilian, Spanish, and Catalan. Wow. And I thought, okay, cool. And they give us, you know, they send us, uh, they send you reader copies of all your foreign stuff. So, like, I just got gone in Latvian, um, <laughs> you know, so, which is why we have a storage locker, because it's, like, thousands of, uh, you know, books. Uh, the coolest for us were, uh, for animals were Hebrew and Indonesian because, uh, Hebrew oh, yeah. <laughs> printed backwards, you know, so it goes, uh, it's right to left, oh, which yeah. was just, we love because you pick it up and go, wow, it's a misprint. This is, this is bizarre. Oh yeah. That's right. It's backwards. <laughs> yeah. It covers on the wrong end. Okay, cool. So we like that. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, one of our oldest arguments on our podcast, um, is actually, see, we're both filmmakers. We both work in the film industry. Um, it's oh, yeah? areas. Cool. Yeah. And, um, so why don't you make a movie of animal then? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's certain permissions and copyright issues. Um, just wait yeah, on the you'd rights. Have to, <laughs> you'd have to talk to Deborah Forte about that. Uh, we'll get you her number after the show. But, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but one of our oldest arguments is, and you, you just mentioned this in that, uh, Reddit AMA is whether it would have done better as an animated series or like I've kind of fought for um, a live action film, like not a, not a TV series because that budget just right. really can't handle that, but, but a live action film that could really do it right. Yeah. What, this, what are your it, thoughts it's on always that? Been, it, it's always been about the budget because especially, you know, back in the nineties, uh, special effects, I mean, the special effects you can do on your laptop now in those days, you know, would have taken, uh, you know, 200 computers grinding away, Mm-hmm. you know, rendering for 500 hours to get anything. And, you know, we can crank it out on, on, on a Mac laptop now. And so it's a lot harder to get and a lot more expensive. Well, you know, and then there's underage actors. Under Hollywood rules, that means you have to have a tutor on the set. You can only work a certain number of hours a day, blah, blah, blah. And then animals. 
And then there was the topic of uh, the things we were talking about anyway. Yeah. Is there any conceivable way, short of, you know, like life of Pi level uh, uh, computer computer graphics, that you can show a tiger fighting a hork bajir? No, there isn't. <laughs> no. no, there is. There's no way to put that on TV. And not with anything like the budget that they had. If they had gone animated, if they'd gone, you know, the uh, uh, Batman animated series, which is what we were, what we told them we thought they should do. A fantastic they could have series, yes. Done a much better. Oh, it's beautiful. And we saw that one. It's like, oh, look at this, man. This isn't, this isn't Disney, you know, just uh, going with the fluidity of action. But look how much they get out of the, uh, you know, out of basically still shots. You know, for the most part, there there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, movement. There was a lot of you know, Batman advances, his shadow advances ahead of him, and the artwork does the rest. And you're like, yeah, it, it could have been three frames for all I know. But it still worked. It was great. We loved the series and thought this is what Animorphs should be because then the animals don't cost anything and the special effects don't cost anything. And in animation, you can absolutely have a tiger fight a hork majeure. Why not? I, in, I, uh, I agree have, with you entirely. Have, <laughs> yeah. Now, as a, as a movie... The thing we love about movie is we, we don't understand why some director hasn't just decided I've got to do this because to from both of our perspectives, just shooting the world through the eyes of the red tail hawk would be amazing. That alone. But then you get into uh, let's look at the world through the eyes of uh, through the senses of an ant or a termite or a skunk or a lobster or a you know, any animal you care to mention. Find ways to to create, um, you know, an awareness in film of scent and of uh, hyper hearing, you know, that, that uh, say a wolf's hearing um, or its ability to smell um, or an owl's night vision or all these things. I thought, I thought what a bonanza for an imaginative guy, director to, to create. Um, and I still think that. I still think it'd be great today and we'd be a lot more affordable now given, you know, where computer graphics are now. Uh, as opposed to 10, 15 years ago. And there's hope. Uh, you know, there's still, you know, we hear rumors every now and then. But, uh, <laughs> there were we some not, recent uh, mutterings. Yeah, and that, that, that ended up being kind of a, an, uh, an unpleasant episode in that uh, the story was incorrect, mm. uh, as we found out, and everybody involved was terribly embarrassed. We were all very disappointed to hear the news, but at the same time, if it's not animated, I don't think it can be done a hundred percent properly. Well, it could, it could, but it was a huge budget. That's the problem. I mean, that's that's the other problem. Is basically it's a bunch of kids, and we're talking about a hundred million dollar movie, and that you know before you're talking about promo or anything else, a hundred million dollars to shoot it. Well, that's that's a hefty ask. Um, it's a lot more expensive even than like a Divergent movie or a Twilight movie or one of those. And you think about it, just like every fucking shot would be special effects. <laughs> and, uh, and you still have the problem with kid actors. And you got the problem with whether or not the demographics work, you know, in terms of sales. So I can, I can talk this thing down. But uh, we've also told them, if, look, if you need to age the kids up by a few years, that's cool with us. Um, and we understand that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really not egomaniacs about uh, Hollywood development. We're not those people going in and going, it has to be every word we've said uh, has to be you know, kept exactly intact. We understand movie making is fundamentally different than book writing and that they have limitations that we don't, but that they also have you know, possibilities that we don't perhaps or may not have thought about. So we're very you know, high on the idea. We'd love somebody to do it if well, they do it decently with a, with a good budget. We've know? seen... Or, yeah, as you point out, animated. Yeah. Get Brad Bird to do an animated version of it. <laughs> love it. Yeah. Well, we've seen recently um, that sometimes all it takes is a good show reel or a teaser trailer or something. Look at Deadpool. Deadpool was non-existent until they made just that random teaser that leaked on, you know, quote unquote, leaked online, and then they got uh-huh. the budget for a fifty-eight million dollar movie. Um, so. Yeah. Have you seen it? I just saw it. That was pretty good. Yeah, I saw I it. I saw four it. Out of five stars. Yeah. yeah, it was it was way better than I thought it was going to be. It kind of some of the trailers I think undersold it. Sorry guys, haven't seen it. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Deadpool yeah. lives. How about that? There's, there's your spoiler. He's That's the surprise, ultimate surprise, spoiler. The hero doesn't die. Uh, real quick, it, Michael, I know that uh, Catherine has lived in Minnesota. 
Um, I don't know if you know this, but that's where I live currently. Uh, where did she live? Well, we lived uh, together, and uh, we're writing uh, Anna Morse and our and our first kid was born there. Oh uh, wow! And we lived down. We lived uh, to begin with downtown Minnesota, downtown Minneapolis, in um, Symphony Place. I think it's called an apartment complex that is attached to right next to the Hilton and attached to the Skyway. Oh yeah, and okay. We love we love the Skyway. It was like, oh okay, this is making Minnesota tolerable. Oh, exactly. And, so, <laughs> That's how you uh, get so around like, in the cold. We could actually walk around. You know, we could like wear socks or something and go to our bank if we wanted to, or you know, go down to these apartment stores. And we lived, then lived uh, right next to it, basically in Marquette Place, which is another apartment complex. Right. And then we had the kid, and thought, well, we need to go be in a house because don't you have to have a house when you have a kid? And we rented a house out in um, one of the suburbs. I can't remember which one. Minnetonka. And oh, yeah, Minnetonka. after about six months, we were kind of looking around, why the fuck are we here? <laughs> like, because it's well, a lovely in, place, Michael. <laughs> we're in Minnetonka, for God's sake. We're not even in Minneapolis. And we're now we're Minnetonka. So we moved to Chicago. And we had also, by that point, um, become uh, Animorphs money was rolling in. And we were... You know, we weren't poor anymore. We'd been yeah, you're living like kings. <laughs> yeah, we had been desperately poor. You know, most of our relationship, Catherine and I, were, when we first, when we sold our first book, we were cleaning toilets for a living. We were not, you know, we were not doing well. And then uh, we kind of worked our way up out of that. And we we're doing okay. Uh, but still, you know, it's paycheck to paycheck, book to book, until Animorphs hit. And then suddenly it was just it was insane. You know, so, yeah, I bet. Oh, especially with course, all that merchandising money rolling in. Oh, we got nothing off merch. <laughs> well, Never. you know, I wanted no, to know what your favorite is, is piece to, of merch was. Merch was tied to the. Uh, it was in a basket with the uh, with a TV series. So in ah. other words, it was never it was never going to earn out. We were never going to see a penny out of it. Those Transformers toys, we never saw a dime, oh. and we never will. I'm sorry, I bought yeah, those no. trying to support you. And, uh... Well, they were cool. <laughs> you you want to know a cool story? You want to know something weird about that? When we first started the Animorphs, you know, uh, when we were just like written the first couple of books, uh, we were in Target, Catherine and I, and I said, you know, we're going to get uh, we're going to get a line of Transformers out of this. I bet. Seriously. <laughs> and then she, she, of course, goes, "What's a Transformer?" <laughs> um, and I, I almost divorced her. Uh, <laughs> decided not to. It was, it was almost as shocking as many years later when the first uh, Iron Man movie came out and I said, uh, oh, I'm, I gotta go see Iron Man. And she looks and goes, what's an Iron Man? It's like, are, are, <laughs> it's are a song by Ozzy Osbourne. Are you, are you seriously fucking with me at this point? You, know, <laughs> you don't know who, who, it's not a what, it's a who. Tony Stark, for God's sake. Do you know nothing? <laughs> so it's one of those, one of those, uh, you know, nerd, unregular person violence yeah. <laughs> on my part. <laughs> What the hell? What do you yeah. mean? Yeah. Speaking of wives, I was um I promised my wife I would ask you a question. I, I told sure. her it'd probably been asked quite a few times, but she really wanted me to ask you this. Uh if you could morph any animal, what would you uh <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> what would you morph? The would cliche be... of cliche questions. No, it's gotta be it would be something that flies, I think. Uh I I it would be some one of the birds of prey, probably a red tailed hawk, just because, you know, red tails have been very, very good to us. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> and I mentioned this on Reddit the other day, but we we have one here. Really? So I'm actually sitting. I'm sitting on my deck here. Uh, this is in Tiburon, which is a um, uh, uh, little community. <laughs> community. It's a, it's a bunch of rich white people, basically, uh, <laughs> many of whom own yachts. We're not those people, but we live here anyway. So we live uh, uh, on the side of a hill, and right now I'm looking out over San Francisco Bay and the cities over there and there's jets flying overhead and Angel Isle and Alcatraz and all this and the Bay Bridge off in the distance. Um, and so there's kind of a drop, I guess it's probably about two, 300 feet between us and town down below us. And a red tail comes around uh, a couple times a week and just kind of floats right around my eye level out here doing his thing, man, riding the thermals, looking for a mouse. <laughs> the thermals. So, you know how I learned about thermals? <laughs> It was from you. <laughs> I we learned about it from us too. We had no idea until we read a book about hawks. And like, ah, okay, that's what they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He goes. He goes out. Uh, he. I assume it's a he. Um, once I saw him with somebody, there was another uh, red tail, uh, who of course we immediately nicknamed Rachel. If you go with, uh, <laughs> with Tobias. 
And then they fought to the death. <laughs> that would have been cool. Every now and then the crows and, and the red tail get into it. But mostly it's the red tail and the buzzards, you know, fly around. The buzzards don't seem to care about it, and the red tails seem to not be not be competing. But the crows are not happy about the hawk. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think you mentioned uh, once on Twitter um, that uh, you guys do have some sort of control on whether Animorphs continues um, in some capacity. Would you ever be open to another author taking on the series, or would you guys be pretty hard-pressed about that? I don't know. Um, the bigger issue would be Scholastic, of course, because yeah. they've got rights in this, too. Uh, and, you know, they tried to relaunch, which didn't go anywhere. Um, they, you know, they did a reprint of what the first six books, seven books, whatever it was, and that just, it just did not catch on. Yeah. Um, what I want to do with it actually is get back the electronic rights and put it all up online for, you know, I don't know, as cheap as we can, uh, cover costs just to keep the stuff out there. It, one of the, one of the great things about digital publishing and as, as scared as we all were in the industry of it, 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 it has a couple of interesting benefits. One is if you're digital, there's no such thing as out of print. So if you're a print book, you go into Barnes and Noble and they basically put a clock on it and go, you know, has it sold? Has it sold? No, it hasn't. Fuck it. It's out of here. And it's never heard from again. It just disappears down the memory hole and into a used bookstores. Digital, it's there essentially forever, which is attractive to me. And, um, and, and, and you don't have to worry about having, you know, more than three books, four books on the shelf. You're not competing for space. That's part of the problem with the Animorphs model now is the publishers don't want uh, series clogging up space with backlist, basically, mm -hmm. right? So they don't mind book 17 out there. They don't want books 1 through 17 sitting there. It <laughs> takes up a lot of shelf space. Yeah. But in the digital space, there is no space limitation. So we're not, we're not all competing for X number of linear feet of shelf space. We, there is no competition for space. There is competition for attention, but that's different. I mean, stuff can sit out there essentially forever. Um, which and and as many of them as we want, so we'd like to get back digital on this, and we're kind of half-assedly talking to Scholastic about it, just so we can put it out there and you know put it out for ninety-nine cents a book or whatever. You know, we've all been surprised though that uh, YA in middle grade is not is not embraced digital at all, basically. Yeah. Huh. Well, about yeah. that um about that re-release of Animorphs. I mean, it didn't seem like they mm -hmm. really marketed it i mean they put it out there and and they tried to you know update the covers and obviously a lot of the references uh were updated which i didn't think mattered i don't think a 90s period piece is that horrible of a thing but um, yeah i mean yeah but i mean it's, it made them it made them happy so whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah well part of it is we couldn't really promote it and we couldn't really promote it because we didn't it wasn't worked into our schedule so Catherine in particular was doing ivan and was promoting that. You know, that that's what she was involved with. Um, and didn't have time to go out on the road to do animals. And mm -hmm. we weren't sure, you know, how much of a commitment there would be from Scholastic. It's really, uh, you know, expensive to have um, either of us out on the road. Uh, when they put me on a book tour, that, that's a costly bit of work yeah. for somebody and for, for extremely limited gain, to the best of my you know, awareness anyway. So, you know, it, you know, I don't fly coach anymore. So <laughs> not, they don't, I don't, I don't take the middle seat in the back of the plane for you know $190. I get the seat up front for $800. So it's a lot more pricey keeping us out there. So and had Scholastic never, that, uh, they felt it was worth it. Had Scholastic never considered uh, the possibility of releasing maybe like a Animorphs collection, like several books collected into one volume? I, I, yeah, I, I, it was called bind ups, I think, in the business. They just did that. It's interesting because, uh, we, we did it with, uh, an earlier series of ours. Um, let's see, Simon, is that Simon? No, it was, it was Harper kind of thing, right? Uh, called Boyfriend's Girlfriend, which we'd written before Animorphs and has now been, was re released first as Making Out and then it was re released now as a bind up called The Islanders. Um, and that's gone nowhere. So we, yeah. don't, we, don't, we, don't know. we don't know the economics of this or how much any of it makes sense. But in terms of, of sheer promo, well, we never did any promo for Animorphs the first time around because when, you know, were we going to go out on the road? We were 
like they're writing. putting out like you know 15, 16, 18 books a year. Yeah, and they would say, you know, they would offer turn this out. And would you like to do some events? Would you like to come to New York and hang out with us? They're like, no, we don't really want to talk to people or hang out. <laughs> you with couldn't people. even enjoy your fame. <laughs> no, there was there wasn't during it. It was after. That's part of the reason we quit. It was like, Jesus, we got all this money now. We should like take time off and go do stuff. Um, <laughs> So we did that. Well, I think I think you know all of your fans and everything are lucky that you guys are both putting out. I mean, just amazing work that's non animorphs related. So um, at least we have that. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we always knew. Uh, I always knew Catherine had another year. You know that she um, <laughs> that that she could do something like Ivan or like Crenshaw, her two most recent books, or Home of the Brave before them where she can write, uh, frankly, literary kind of stuff, you know, and she's, that's the more of the writer she's always been underneath it all. The mm-hmm. person she wanted to be when she grew up was a person who um, obsesses over every sentence and, you know, and is careful about her word choices and rhythm and metaphor and simile and all the stuff that, uh, you know, that when you're producing a book every three weeks, you don't have a lot of time. But we used to joke, you know, you got, it's like a timer, you know, we've got a simile here. You know, the the rock was like a, like a, like a, okay, time's up, screw it. It's like a rock. I said, like, move on. <laughs> you know, not, not a lot of time for sitting there picking the mot juste and getting everything exactly, exactly perfect and squared away. <clears throat> but she always wanted to be able to write like that. And uh, now she is. And um, it's, it was funny because we actually um, had a kind of tongue-in-cheek plan for her to win the Newbery. And then she actually <laughs> went out and did it. Which yeah. Kind of like, okay then. Alrighty. That was a book that I was actually reading when I worked in a uh, school, and so I was uh, taking it around to a lot of the teachers, showing them uh, what an excellent tool it can be um, to use in the classroom for students that are struggling with reading and whatnot. Um, haven't been back since. Yeah. I really hope they adapted it. <laughs> it's uh, it's short chapters. Uh, so you get a real sense of accomplishment, especially with um, with readers who are not as confident going into it. Um, if yes, you've got precisely. a three-page chapter, they can go, look at that, I wrote a whole chapter. Or in some cases, you know, she's written one-page chapters or one-paragraph chapters. And so it gives well, people a sense of accomplishment momentum that staring at a, a brick wall of text does not. Yep, the simplistic uh, dialogue of the protagonist, who is, of course, a, a gorilla, <laughs> also yeah. attributes to that. Yeah, Ivan wasn't that well educated, so he, he kept his uh, he kept his vocabulary fairly basic. <laughs> he never went to college. nice painter though. Nice painter that Ivan. He was he did um, yeah. It, well, first of all, Ivan did uh, uh, has a movie deal and uh, has done extremely well. It's been on the New York Times list for like two years in one form or another. So we're like, geez, this is great, um, and. Uh, um, as a movie deal. And so we're, we don't know if that's ever going to happen, but it'd be nice if it did. Well, maybe it'll be out in time uh, for me to have my first child and take them to see it. There you go. As, as long as they don't screw it up. It's a hard thing to turn into a movie just because it's such it's so delicate, basically, you know, there's not a lot of uh, uh, obvious action and it's, it's, it's kind of uh, restricted in terms of space. So it needs somebody with a very imaginative approach. The, the whoever, model did, uh, whoever did the movie adaptation of Charlotte's Web, or uh, even better, Babe. Oh yeah, Babe <laughs> is like you know based on I don't know like a nine-page book or something, and yeah, they got a brilliant movie out of it. it just, I, we love Babe. It was just a, a, a classic. But then we look around and go, well, okay, what are the other examples of kids' books being turned into great movies? And we're like, yeah, not that many. Um, <laughs> the Phantom <yeah>. Tollbooth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know they're hard to it's hard to do sometimes. Doesn't always work. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think I speak for you know all the people who listen to our podcast and everything. Where um, we love the work you're putting out now, but you know we're always keeping our ears out if anything happens with any kind of sequel series or if anything's continued. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like a at least in the film industry and and somewhat in books, it's a lot of old or older um, properties are coming back and coming back strong because they have that fan base built in. Um, just, oh, we did Ender's, Ender's Game and uh, uh, Lois Lowry, what's that, uh, The Giver, uh, oh, yeah. which have all been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're we're still hopeful, and it could still happen. 
We don't know. <laughs> you know, we're just we kind of, uh, to be honest with you, we're just frustrated with dealing with Hollywood generally. Um, where, uh, you know, uh, you, you go down and you do the coach tour and people tell you they love you and you're talented and we want to be in the, the business with you and et cetera, et cetera. And then nothing ever happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, well, we're kind of over that now. It's weird because I can go to New York and come out, you know, in three days and have a book deal. And I go to Hollywood again and again and again and nothing ever happens or we get an option or something. You know, I've got a movie deal for Berserk. We've got a movie deal for Ivan. We've got a TV deal for Gone. Um, and then, you know, and then nothing ever shows up on my TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Like I said, sometimes you just need that visual reference. Maybe some fan uh, starts yeah, a Kickstarter you, uh, and gets a teaser trailer a, made. Yeah. Well, it's the expensive thing to do, but I, I I would love if somebody did that. I wish I had the talent to do that, but I'm not a I'm not a movie guy. So yeah. movie people, why don't you do that? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not <laughs> gonna I'm not gonna say I don't have a script and a budget on my laptop that I'm speaking mm-hmm. to you on right now, but um, that would be a lie. So, <laughs> well, we certainly won't uh, object. We you know we're we're fairly blunt about wanting a movie and wishing that. Uh, Things are moving forward, and we have serious questions about whether the people who currently control the rights to it really know what they have and know how to sell it. Mm-hmm. Because Animorphs is a, was, you know, Animorphs is, a, to our surprise, very much became, <clears throat> uh, you know, something bigger than just it's about a bunch of kids turning into animals. I mean, people are devoted to it, obviously. I mean, here I am on, on a podcast that, in large part, has flown from it. And all of this, of course, came as a surprise to us. Uh, we weren't expecting it, or the, the longevity of it, the, the endurance of it. <clears throat> People still care about it years later. I did, the, like I said, a Reddit thing, and um, probably 80% of the questions were about animals. And we, by the way, don't resent that at all because, you know, we love the fans. The animals people change our lives in just profound ways. Um, and so that was, that's a big, it's a big, right back big at thing. <laughs> yeah, that was well, a big thing. I think it's just the fact and, that, and it, or go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, and what was so cool was, you know, at the time we didn't even get fan letters. We, I mean, they came, but we couldn't deal with them because it was like massive numbers. And it's not like we had a staff. It's just us, you know, it's just two of us. And we were doing a lot of writing, obviously. And so we just had to make scholastic hand out, you know, kind of boilerplate. Uh, responses to them so we didn't really know and every now and then we get a letter and just you know some kid writing in pencil or whatever that they were important to them and something was like yeah that's great it wasn't until years later that when we meet the grown-up animorphs fans and at the point where they're now college kids and they would come up uh we do an event or something or Catherine would do an event and they would come up with just like tears draining down their faces just you know shaking and <laughs> we're like oh my god this is like and, and we get letters from people going, I learned philosophy from animals. I, I have decided to, you know, take a job pursuing social justice because of the animals. And we're just like kind of overwhelmed by this. You know, it's kind of, you don't expect it because we're just these two dumbasses writing a, you know, a bunch of books trying to make a living. Mm-hmm. And then it has an effect out there in the real world. I know it seems naive but it, that we wouldn't expect it to have an effect out there in the real world, but you kind of don't think in those terms. Or at least we don't. We're not people who take themselves seriously. <laughs> you know, or well, think we're on some mission. But that was neat. That was kind of humbling. We said in, yeah. in one of our first episodes that, um, you know, me and Mitchell, we're adults. We have very pretty stressful jobs. I just got married in November. Um, neither of us. Thank you. Uh, neither of us are obsessed with the series. We're not, we're not like, you know, drawing fan art like some fans are and and talking about it every single day but we wanted to start a podcast because this series it, it goes further than than just a children's book series it doesn't treat you dumb it, it got into some concepts that were well above um what's expected of a, a middle grade uh chapter book series and it, it just stuck with us i mean it got me through i know in middle school i had just moved to ohio um never grew up anywhere near there or anything. And uh, I, I had a real problem making friends. Uh, I was bullied quite a bit, getting into fights and stuff. And I had Animorphs. I mean, that was that was the thing I looked forward to was an Animorphs book coming yeah, out. Yeah, that's, that's, that's huge. That's, and that's, you know, at one level, we just wanted to succeed because we wanted to be R.L. Stein. 
you know, that was our goal was to be RL Stein. We wanted, we wanted to be Goosebumps, basically. Mm-hmm. And, and the funny thing was, we actually sat down and analyzed Goosebumps and said, okay, Goosebumps delivers basically a, a single emotional punch. You know, it's, it's about uh, the thrill of fear. They're not, you know, serious fear, not terror, but, you know, that kind of little frisson. And we thought, that's the, our problem is we always make shit too complicated. So we're going to do a series. And then, of course, and we're going to keep it simple. And it's going to have a single point and a single through line. Naturally, being the people we are, we promptly turned it into this complex thing involving, you know, just war theory and, you know, sympathies with the enemy and, and all the rest of it and the morality of parasitism versus predatory you know, uh, predation and all the rest of the stuff we stuck in there. And it made it the exact opposite of what we intended it to be, which was simple. We thought, okay, simple punch, we're going to do this, a one-punch deal. We're going to deliver a particular experience. And then by the end of book one, we're already into often do shades of gray and ambiguity with the question of whether or not Tobias deliberately stayed in war yeah. uh, to, to say a hawk. And we never really kind of answered that question in any kind of um, explicit way, I don't think. And then we thought, oh, okay, so we're going to do our usual shit where we make everything way too complicated. And at the same time, we were writing uh, Barfarama. And we thought, well, Barfarama is going to be a hit. Animorphs will be this little niche thing with like just smart kids will read. And Barfarama will be this hit. Exactly. That's what Barfarama went. You know, we did a bunch of books. But um, as far as we can tell, we were told the only place it really sold was on college campuses. They're like, oh, yeah, it would be, it would be fun to get stoned and read Barfarama. I can see that. Uh, <laughs> I got to grab a copy now. And, <laughs> Well, it was funny. If you haven't read it, I actually think it's fine. It was, I, we had mostly me, but we had a good time with it just because um, they more or less said, uh, we said, well, how, you know, how creepy, how, you know, how sickening should we get? They go, oh, you know, do whatever you want to do. Well, don't tell us that. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> naturally, it's, it's as nauseating as we can possibly make it. Um, <laughs> And yet, hopefully, you know, hopefully entertaining or funny if you're, if you're sufficiently high. <laughs> sufficiently, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. personally, thank you for making Animorphs complicated and and going crazy with it because it's it's incredibly important to me and it got me through some hard times. So, <laughs> oh, good. That's that's very cool to hear. It it remains extremely gratifying that people care about it and that people uh, enjoyed it and that, and especially so that people think that their lives were improved by it. So neat. Yes, I think yeah, it, nice. it happened to happen during a time when we were so impressionable, and this is when I was just starting out, just learning to read, uh, probably third, fourth grade. Oh, I guess, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't reading, <laughs> learning to read around then. But yeah. this is when I was really getting into reading, and your books, <laughs> right. along with Mr. Stein's, as you mentioned, uh, yeah. greatly contributed to that. I would even go as far as to say, is they're the reason that I myself am a writer today. Um, well, congratulations on being a writer, or condolences, depending. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you write? Uh, I have uh, just released my third book in my uh, own young adult series entitled uh, The Devil Ash Saga. It is about cool. a half human, half devil who is trapped in hell and trying as hard as he can to escape. Oh, interesting. I've been wanting, I've, I've had this idea in the back of my head for probably 10 years, uh, which I call CEO of Hell. It's a working title, obviously, but what the essential concept is that uh, uh, hell has become terribly overcrowded and unmanageable, and it's because <laughs> Satan Satan was never a numbers guy; he was always an artist. And now, <laughs> and now the uh, the board, which in my imagination consists of uh, God the Father, Jesus, and all the other gods who have been surpassed over time, but they got kind of grandfathered in. So you know, uh, Odin's there and Zeus. And all these guys decide that it's time to hire a new Satan. So they basically <laughs> fire Satan and hire uh, somebody from from business to come in and organize shit. And that's, <laughs> that's the essential starting off point. Um, but I've never ca- gotten around to writing it. Yeah, I, I should probably write it someday. Wow, you know, I, like I want that book. That, and I like it because it is nothing like my series, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the great thing is I, I keep worrying about that. And uh, Catherine, in particular, every time Publishers Weekly comes out, I got to hear, oh, this is too close to my book. It's mm. also about a primate. And I go, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> the same fucking thing. Every, every fucking time we decide something is too much like what we've done, and then we go look at the actual book and realize, no, it's nothing like it. 
it's like people going with Gone and uh, Under the Dome. You know, right. I write, I write, and, and by the way, the Simpsons movie. So you got three groups. You got the Simpsons people, me, and Stephen King, all writing about <laughs> people cut off by being under a dome. Yeah. You know, there's the the overlap between them amounts to dome. Everything else is completely different. There's nothing. There's no comparison between the. They three. have a shape and, in common. Yeah. Well, to be fair, that, that's it. To be fair, you came first, so who cares what the other ones? I did. <laughs> no, I'm well. I'm not sure the Simpsons would be mad because they've got a long lead time on a script. You know that may have come out. They may have been working on that. Uh, and King says he was working on it. You know that it was a concept he'd had since like the '80s. It was one of those things, you know, like my CEO of hell, that you kind of keep in the back of your head and you'll do it someday and when you get an angle on it. You're so building, through the path uh, and the wheel, all, the three of us all came out like within a year and a half or two years of each other. And, you know, that's how I got the blurb from Stephen King. Because he contacted us to say, you know, I just wanted you to know I didn't rip you off. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, uh, Mr. King, I, you can't see me over the over the internet, Mr. King, but I'm bending my knee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the literal claw. King has arrived. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Stephen King's my you know he's my guy. That's who I want to be. I want to be him. I want to be That's that so great. Good. You want to be, be Stephen King, fat. and we want to be you. It's like if we could well, just morph go. somehow. <laughs> well, it's just I mean, goddamn, the man's older than I am, but he can still outwork me. I can't stand it. It's just he's so fast and so good and so hip on, like, everything that's going on in the world he seems to be plugged into. And then he's got spare time to, you know, be in a band or whatever. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of amazing because, man, I'm productive. You know, I'm a productive writer. I write a lot. And he just shoots past me like a Lamborghini going past a Ford. You know, it's ridiculous. So. It is. It is crazy that I mean, I just read uh, not too long ago his sequel to The Shining, Doctor Sleep, and it's it's. I love The Shining. The Shining is one of my favorite books of all oh, time. I haven't read that yet. And Doctor Sleep holds up. I mean, it is on the same level Does it? as The Shining, and it's the a Shining great is intense, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's. I love it's The amazing. Shining. And that that taught me a lot. That taught me a lot about writing. The Shining. You should definitely check out Doctor Sleep. It's yeah. it's good. But you should definitely oh, will, check out the hotel in Colorado where it's based off of. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with Mr. King, isn't it? You know, if he would just slow the hell down, then I could read all of his books. <laughs> but no, he's got to write nine books a year, or whatever the hell his output is. Yeah. So, no, he's a he's he's my my literary hero. <laughs> well, um, I know we've taken up a lot of your time, but uh, I don't know, problem. man, it's been a great conversation. We really appreciate you doing this for us. Well, thanks definitely. for having me. Appreciate. It. We appreciate more than just you taking the time to talk to us, but literally everything you've done in the past 30 years. Thank you well, for thanks, all of dude. I wish I wish Catherine were here, but she's uh, with her, uh, my in-laws, her parents in Virginia at the time. Well, Otherwise, you know, I'd have her stop in and say hi. It's, it's always possible that maybe you'd be gracious enough to uh, uh, have, have her yeah. and you on the show again in the near future. Just She's not doing anything for six months. That's her theory. I'm not doing any public appearances or anything for six months. This won't hold up, but, you know, it's one of those things that she... Oh, we're going to be doing this podcast for years still. So. There you go. Yeah, we're on the okay, Hork Bajir well, Chronicles, and we've been doing this already for two years. So that shows you our I pace. Love... <laughs> cool, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michael Grant, for uh, sticking around and talking with us today. Okay. Thanks. I had a good time. Appreciate it.